Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the uh, second session of the second day of this very interesting conference on Cyprus and the Commonwealth. Uh, uh, the title of the second session is Cyprus and the Commonwealth in Political Perspective. I am Michalis Gondos, uh, Assistant Professor uh, in the Department of Politics and Governance of the University of Licosia. And uh, I have the pleasure uh, to, uh, to chair this session with two distinguished uh, um, uh, speakers. Uh, actually, we had a change on the original schedule. It was planned for three speakers, but because Professor Achilles Emilianidis delivered at the end of the day his speech yesterday in the opening ceremony, we have two speakers with slightly more time at their disposal, but still this will save us time for the discussion uh, at the end. I will start um, uh, immediately with our first uh, uh, speaker, who is Dr. Elizabeth Niggas. Let I me just... Uh, let I, me think it's the, I think it's Theophanus who is first. Uh, apologies, apologies. Yes, Professor, you're right. It is <laughs> Professor Andreas Stefanus, uh, the first speaker. Professor Andreas Stefanus, uh, who is uh, uh, the uh, who is professor uh, at the University of Nicosia and head of the Department of Politics and Governance of the School of Law of the University. He received uh, his PhD degree in economics from the Pennsylvania State University in the United States in 1988. He served as economic advisor to the president of the Republic of Cyprus from September 1990 to February 1993. He is professor of economics and public policy, president of the Cyprus Center for European and International Affairs, and as I already said, head of the Department of Politics and Governance of the University of Nicosia. He visited several European, American, and other universities and think tanks as a visiting professor, senior fellow, or guest speaker. He is the author of several books and many articles, as well as policy papers. This focus on the Cyprus problem, Cyprus EU relations, EU Turkish relations, Eastern Mediterranean affairs, issues of governance in bi ethnic and multi ethnic societies, European integration, political economy, and the Euro debt crisis. The title of uh, Professor Theophanus' uh, speech is A Critical Assessment of the Relations Between the Republic of Cyprus and Britain, 1960 to 2020, and the way forward. Professor Stefanus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, I will try to cover, address some highlights of more than 60 cases in about 20 minutes. I think this is a, a, a hard task. We would see narratives, different perspectives, issues of the past, present, and more importantly about the future. I would say that there are historical grievances and at the same time many areas in which cooperation can lead to mutual benefits. Now, starting uh, with the birth of the Republic of Cyprus, we all know that um, the objective of the Oga struggle was the unification of the island Enosis with Greece. That did not materialize and we came uh, to what came to be known as the creation of a reluctant republic. I would also say that um, in 1955, the United Kingdom invited Turkey as an interested player to address the Cyprus uh, question. It addressed uh, with Greece and Turkey, I think that was uh, a major issue in the sense that United Kingdom brought Turkey as an interested as an interested player in the Cyprus question, while Turkey had given up its any claims on Cyprus in the Treaty of Lausanne much earlier in 1923. So that is some of the past. 
I mentioned the creation of a reluctant republic. We had a very difficult constitution based on diarchy, strong by communalism. Uh, and I would also say that with the beginning of the days of the Young Republic, there is on the island a very strong anti-British narrative, a pro-yoga narrative. At the same time, several issues of legitimacy were raised. Furthermore, at the same time, or rather at the same time, Britain enjoys the benefits of the sovereign basis with, uh, that were part of the agreements that created the Republic of Cyprus. Obviously, the first years of the Young Republic were difficult. They were, these were turbulent years. And uh, because of many as factors, including a very difficult con constitution, external interferences, lack of political maturity, we had the, the first crisis in 1963, which ended up with intercommunal clashes. Um, Macarius, President Macarius had uh, uh, submitted on November 30th, 1963, 13 points for the revision of the Constitution. There have been reports or allegations that the High Commissioner at the time encouraged Macarius to do so. Personally, even if that's the case, I do not think that the Archbishop needed any encouragement. Uh, the Greek government had expressed strong reservations, but Macarius was determined to have a functional constitution and also a redefinition of the power sharing arrangements of 1960. There was a, a Turkish Cypriot reaction, insurgents, and anger and uh, Turkish aggression towards Cyprus, including bombing of Cyprus. Now, the Security Council at 186 of March 4, 1964 legitimized the new state of affairs, it legitimized the doctrine of necessity and recognized the government of Macarius as the government representing the whole island. If we take at the time the Turkish press, uh, the Turks were accusing, Macar were accusing Britain that it supported uh, the Greek Cypriots and that it supported essentially what came to be known uh, as the coup d'etat of Macarius. That was the Turkish perspectives. Now, uh, in 1974, we had the great disaster. Previous to that, you know, we had the uh, intercommunal negotiations going on. And I would say that they reached a final outcome two days before the coup. Uh, I mean, the island was. Finally, it was going to come to an agreement to settle the internal issues, but again, we had uh, on that tragic July, external interference, which led to the disaster. I would say that, uh, and I'm quoting an ex-foreign minister of Cyprus, Alekos Michaelidis, who told me and also told other people very bitterly, uh, blaming the three guarantor powers for what happened in 74, he said, Greece executed the coup, Turkey invaded, and Britain was taking pictures. Okay, that, that was his sarcastic comment. At the time, uh, I remember the Prime Minister of Greece, Karamanlis, after the collapse of the junta, he said that he could not interfere, he could not support Cyprus militarily, because Cyprus was far away. Now, I think Mr. Karamanlis should have known that when he was signing the Treaty of Guarantee, the Treaty of Alliance back in 1960. In relation to Britain, obviously the distance was not a factor for non-intervention. After all, a few years later, Britain went all the way to Falkland Islands, uh, you know, to make sure that the Argentinians will not take over, will not annex the islands of what they call Malvinas. In Britain interfered uh, further away, but in the case of Cyprus, he stayed behind. My perception is that uh, I would not that the people of Cyprus are paying unnecessarily a very huge price for external interference 
and this goes to the present day. Now, in relation to Turkey, I don't think it will be an exaggeration to say, it has also been said by others, that the way that Turkey is acting in Cyprus, it reminds me of the Nazi Germany in Sudet and Lani in Czechoslovakia, whether they are using a German-speaking minority as a strategic minority to take over Czechoslovakia. I don't think that the... I think there are parallels with the case of Cyprus today. Now, after 74, we had the Greek Cypriots are in a state of shock and confusion. Uh, they are prepared to make every possible sacrifice in order to have a settlement of the Cyprus problem and the reestablishment of the territorial unity, of the territorial integrity of the country. Britain pushes for what is came to be known as by zonal by communal federation. I mean, that is the name of the new perspectives. In 1983, with the unilateral declaration of independence of the occupied northern part of Cyprus, sponsored by Turkey, of course, Britain supports the Republic of Cyprus in the UN Security Council and also supports the relevant resolutions that um, were put forward at the time. Nevertheless, the Greek Cypriots, though, rightly considered that the basis of negotiations, despite of those resolutions thereafter, amounted to the de legitimization of the Turkish actions. At the time, uh, in the latter part of the 80s, Cyprus uh, attempts to, you know, uh, move forward with application to the European community at the time, thinking that uh, accession to the European Union would provide great opportunities for Cyprus in all aspects. Britain at the time prefers a solution of the Cyprus problem first and then application for membership. But the Republic of Cyprus goes ahead and makes the application to the European uh, community, European Union, July 4th, 1990. In the meantime, we have the negotiations, I mean, continuing of negotiations, but leading nowhere. In, in the 90s, there is a new push uh, of the United Nations for uh, the solution of the Cyprus co question, question. And at the same time, we have parallel the accession process of Cyprus. Britain has a major role in the preparation of the Annan plan which is finally rejected by Greek Cypriots, by 76% of the Greek Cypriots, and approved by 65% Turkish Cypriots and the settlers who vote. Numbers are indicative of an extremely unfair and very biased and not, you know, plan. Uh, I would also say that uh, this had, um, you know, it generated a lot of reactions on the past of the European Union about the rejection of Cyprus, of this plan, and that uh, perceptions were that Cyprus could enter as a unified island. Cypriot Greeks said no because they felt that this plan, if implemented, it would make us worse off and a second or a third rate country. What happened since then may convince an objective observer that the Turkish Cypriot community cannot act independently of Turkey. Furthermore, it is allowing Turkey to use it as a strategic minority. And the Turkish Cypriot leader today, Ersin Tatar, states that he's proud to be the man of Turkey in Cyprus and also a proud Ottoman descendant. And the, does the continuing stalemate is no surprise. Now, let me shift a little bit away from the politics of the relations between uh, Cyprus, you know, Turkey and the British road and the perceptions and the bitterness of Greek Cypriots and go to the 2013 economic uh, the crisis which led uh, with the Troika prescriptions in Cyprus. When Cyprus applied for membership in the European Union, there were very high expectations. And the polls indicated that Cypriots were the number one uh, pro-Europeanist. Now, when the crisis came in 2013, and part of the, part of the crisis was the responsibility of Cypriots, policymakers, and companies, banks, households, and all that. But at the same time, there was a problem with the architecture of the European Union, and the treatment of the Eurogroup was too harsh. I will share with you the following. 
It was at that time that Cyprus began to make more comparisons between Britain on the one hand and EU and Germany on the other hand. And I, I would consider that uh, to be a turning point. At the time also, Cypriots felt that um, if Cyprus was in Northwestern Europe, it would not have the treatment it had, or to be very blunt about it, and I heard it in many focus groups, Cypriots felt that if they were not Orthodox, but they were Catholic or Protestant Christians, they would receive a different treatment. Now, I mean, officially this is not been reported, but it's there. So I would say that 2013, there is a reassessment of Cyprus positions at various levels. Although unquestionably Cyprus is a member of the European Union and we will continue to do so, there is a perception of the population that it is also essential to revisit relations with Britain be, despite bitterness of the past and see how we could capitalize on that as well. And this is a fact. And Dina Hilias Emilianidis mentioned something around like that yesterday in relation to this uh, uh, point. If I also examine some socioeconomic and cultural socioeconomic data and cultural relations, we see the following. We see that socioeconomically and culturally, the relations between Cyprus and Britain, we, there is, you know, we will see that if we compare relations Cyprus and Britain with the respective relations with other EU countries, we will see that after Greece, Cyprus is closer to the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the number of Cypriots living in England. Yes. I think we have about 300,000 Greek Cypriots there and about 60,000 Turkish Cypriots. If we see trade relations, the UK is one of the most important trading partners of Cyprus. If we see the number of Cypriots studying in, in British universities in 2016, 2017, we had about nine and a half thousand. In March, 2021, this number increased to 10,000. And we also see figures in relation to tourism we see that the United Kingdom is the country from which most tourists visit Cyprus. Mm. And in 2016, we had 1.15 million tourists. 2017, it was 1.25 million. And in 2019, 1.35 million. So the numbers are overwhelming. And they indicate that there is a lot of scope of, you know, of further enhancing relations between Cyprus and Britain, and thereby Cyprus and also the Commonwealth. Now, with Brexit, I think that despite Brexit, relations between Cyprus and Britain will continue to be important. Yeah. It is essential for the two countries to engage into a meaningful discussion about issues where there is scope for further cooperation, but also about issues that make the relations difficult. We have these issues include economy, education, tourism, and I would also include security. Talking about Brexit, allow me to make a suggestion. Now, we had two small states in the European Union where in, it's, it's Cyprus and Malta. They were two former colonies. One of the issues that could be examined is to see whether there could be in various aspects preferential, preferential treatment in the new state of affairs. This could be done on a bilateral level or within the framework of Commonwealth, but I think it's something that it has to be examined further. Now, in conclusion, uh, I would say again and repeat, it is essential for the two countries to reassess the relations, their relations. It is important to come to terms with the past and also explore ways in which mutual objectives can be pursued. And I think also from the part of Britain, it's important for Britain to reassess and acknowledge its obligations to the Republic of Cyprus. And we can also see what can be done to expand, enhance relations with mutual benefits within the framework of bilateral relations and also of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, at the end of the day, you didn't make use of the extended time that uh, you enjoyed. Uh, you finished in 16 minutes. Oh, you didn't uh, tell me. I thought it was 20 since you started. 
Uh, I could yeah. elaborate. I could elaborate. Yes, I, uh, this is uh, this is something that we said before uh, the beginning of the. So, if you want to add something, you still have uh, uh, four minutes. If uh, okay, if, yes, I think um, what I would what I would underline, I would just underline and then come back in the question and answer session is um, there are two issues at the political level and the emotional level. You know, there is a bitterness on the part of the Greek Cypriots in the sense there is a strong feeling that we were not treated fairly over time. I started with the issue when Britain invited Turkey as an interested party in a conference in London, unnecessarily so. We saw the, reflect, the Constitution 1960 reflected an imbalance of power. I think Britain makes up for it in 1964 by supporting the, the res, Security Resolution um, 186. At the same time, that analysis points out to the fact that this took place because Britain thought that its interests would be served with a united Cyprus, unitary state of Cyprus, rather than a partition between Greece and Turkey. So there is a, an explanation for that. In 1974, Greek Cypriots expected differently, you know, because sometimes in the various discourses and narratives about what happened, you know, um, they talk about the, the fault of the Greek Cypriots. No, Greek Cypriots had a legitimate government. President Makarios was supported by the vast majority of the Greek Cypriots. We had the discussion of the Cyprus question of the end and final draft it was prepared that was going to be ratified on uh, on that week yet we had the coup from Greece we had Turkish interference now if I go by the Constitution a lot having you know even if we accept that Turkey had a legitimate right to interfere on you know 20th of July with the re-establishment of the constitutional order on July 23, in the person of Mr. Kleridis, who assumed duties of president after the collapse of the Putsch's government, and also with the collapse of the junta in Greece on 23rd, 24th of July, there was no excuse for Turkey to continue its military operations. At the same time, Britain, a country that had bases, sovereign bases in the island, it had a role to intervene accordingly. It did not. I sarcastically pointed out the four lines in Argentina because if it goes for a distance, it was much longer there, and yet they made it all the way to Argentina, and they had their way. And politically, after 74, Cypriot Greeks were not happy with the fact that the proposed uh, formula for reunification would worsen the status quo. That's why we didn't have a solution. Now, if I go to the other aspects, though, cultural relations, educational relations, economic relations, and many other aspects, we see that there, there is a lot of convergence of uh, interest. I think the relations can further expand. And, you know, in my mind, I think it's important to talk about all issues. And when it comes to security, I would say that the sovereign bases are here serving British interests, but the same part of the, the agreement point out that it is their goal also to protect the territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus. I mean, this is an obligation which is not a subjective assessment of Greek Cypriots. It's there, it's written in the agreement. And Britain did not fulfill on that. So you have the historical leg legacies, the historical grievances, and you have a new state of affairs where Britain will, you know, has left the European Union, it will move forward on its own with the Commonwealth. And I think in, this, in that set of arrangements, the Republic of Cyprus has a role to play despite its small size. I think there are issues that we can address positively. And I have no doubt that we can work in ways to enhance uh, uh, mutual interest and also the understanding between the two sides. Thank you, Mihaly, for the extra four minutes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the very interesting points that you have highlighted. Indeed, I have questions to make, uh, but uh, this will happen at the end of the uh, of the of the session or after the speak. 
the speech of uh, Dr. Elizabeth Nigas. Dr. Elizabeth Nigas uh, is our next speaker. Uh, she is an educator, a researcher, an international conference speaker, and book editor. She has authored several books, notably KS2 English. She's contributed to Paradoxes in Education, Learning in a Plural Society. She authored numerous uh, literary 19th century academic papers and has reviewed academic books. She's a chartered teacher and historical affiliate of the Chartered College of Teaching, also a founding fellow of the College of Teaching. In 2017, she was a speaker in the House of Lords. The motion was what are the challenges for international relations in the 21st century? Currently a judge of the English speaking union, Churchill Public Speaking. In 2018, she was honored with a certificate for her educational role in the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Writing Competition. Uh, the title of uh, her speech is uh, Cypriot Diasporas in the Commonwealth. Uh, Dr. Nigas, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Micheles. Um, but I also want to thank um, Professor Andreas Theothanes for his very insightful and powerful talk. I think that's a very hard act to follow. But um, I saw some parallels between your talk and what I'm about to say. So thank you very much for having me. And um, here, here I go. Well, my talk will really focus uh, tightly on the impact and influence of uh, Cyprus diaspora and uh, in education and it's, you know, how it has enhanced um, Britain. So when we think of the term diaspora, uh, we know that it's derived from the Greek verb I scatter, I spread about, which in turn is composed of dia, between, through, across, I sow, I scatter. And so in ancient Greece, the term meant a scattering. But this scattering, we will see how it has impacted the British education. But first I'd like to look at identity because I think it's very important that we know who we are because knowing who we are is what helps a community, is what helps a nation, and what helps the world at large. The past century has seen the word diaspora enter into a new, a new culture beyond orality, script, and print. As a result, we now have to ask ourselves, who are the Cypriots? When we talk of the Cypriot people, it means something more than the human beings currently occupying the status named by that term. According to the social thinker, August Comte, he pointed that, and I quote, a group's culture persists far longer than any of the humans who have shared in it, close quote. He coined the term sociology because he took the view that society could be seen usefully as a living organism or a distinct entity. So in subsequent decades, we have seen Cypriot settlements in the UK took a lot to, to a large extent the form of an extended family. And that was affected. We see this um, quite in a very concrete way because of the effect of the 1962 Commonwealth Act, and that has persisted. Recently, the New Statesman reported and analyzed the tragic impact the pandemic had on the Cypriots in the UK. And what they found was that the main reason why there was a disproportionate Cyp um, deaths among the Cypriots and other ethnic minorities is because most of the Cypriots in UK live in urban areas 
They've got a very tight knit community lifestyle. And of course, they promote inter multi generational household. The very nature of such a community demonstrates excellent traditional values, integrity, a bond, a love. And the great thing is that these values, what we have seen, they've been translated into, they've been moved into the education arena to the degree where it has strengthened British society. The Cypriots we have noticed from a political point of view, from an educational point of view, invest he heavily in education. And I will touch on this later on. But for now, we have an estimated 335,000 Greek Cypriot immigrants living in Great Britain. The majority of the Greek Cypriots in Great Britain currently live in England, there is an estimate around 3,000 in Wales and 1,000 in Scotland. So why such a scattering? Some of these factors are contextual, including circumstances particular to the state of public infrastructure, and ongoing instability, as we can see now with Brexit, we can see with the pandemic, as well as, you know, things such as um, the needs for a lot of the Cypriots to balance education, their jobs, their family. And speaking of jobs, we, we see that this is very important because a lot of, when we look at technicians, teachers, professors, you know, fashion designers, accountants, lawyers, I can say statistics show that we have a healthy proportion of Cypriots in these very professional jobs. These jobs, of course, have been an asset to the UK because they bring in money. We know after the Second World War, um, the government struggled to find a new role for the country because Britain was changing many heavy industries fell into decline, but over time, daily life became more comfortable for most people. The British society, it was changing too. The empire was dismantled, and many people from former colonies came to live in Britain, bringing greater diversity to the nation's culture more than ever before. As I speak, as I was writing this paper, of course, I'm deeply conscious of the impact the global pandemic had on practically every aspect of society, notwithstanding education. So let's go back in time. We examined the first generation of Cypriots who came to the UK. Um, they were um, economic migrants and refugees. And like many migrants, work, housing, healthcare were limited resources, but families recognized the value and importance of having a better lifestyle. And we know that the first generation um, Cypriots, they worked tirelessly, they worked hard to make sure that this generation had a much better life. So for the first generation, their efforts were, of course, the, the efforts consequently paid off. In British University, we have an extraordinary number of Cypriots studying. A huge number of them have well-paid professional jobs. They are highly skilled and have contributed financially, socially, politically, culturally, you know, legally to the British society. The economic benefits, both financial and education, have undoubtedly enhanced the UK. To engage and represent this changing diaspora, the Cypriot Federation a few years ago amended its constitution so that at least 25% of the secretariat had to be under 38 years old. I'm about to quote um, Christos Karalis. Sorry, he pointed out that, and I quote, today, it's closer to 30%, 
And this change has made the Federation far more creative and dynamic, giving us the kind of drive to reach and represent the diaspora in its new form. Christos went on to say um, that he noted how the organized, the organized infrastructure of the community is also changing. We now have new associations forming and joining the Federation that are focused on professional grouping and he cites medics and city professionals, quote, close quote. It is interesting to note that among the 54 Commonwealth countries, it is reported that Cyprus has the fifth highest number of students attending universities in the UK. From an educational point of view, Cypriot diaspora is not just a political ideology. Instead, it is a living organism in terms of scholarly, economic, cultural, aesthetic, and sociology, sociological aspects, and the list goes on. Cyprus's effective diaspora working relationship with the UK government authorities have helped provide education and filled roles that authorities could not fill. In some areas, diaspora offered innovative education practices implemented within individual universities, sometimes in collaboration with government educators, but with the aim of eventual take up into national education systems. As an educator, I, I think this is vitally important. It is something we need because of any country with a strong education base, we know from research in reality and whether in written in reality, as well as in fictional texts, the strong education it gives later on leads to a strong society. So the relationship has also showed that the ways diaspora were able to couple their sense of responsibility with the UK, a strong relationship with the Ministry of Education and a willingness to accept the terms of engagement have been successful to the UK. In return, UK provides large skills training for the Cypriots. And of course, this reciprocal relationship continues to be strengthened. And I do believe, if I may just go back on Professor Theothanus, um, you know, what he said, I do believe with or without Brexit, there will be a strong relationship between Cyp um, Cyprus and the UK. Um, in 2018, the Cyprus News Agency um, had um, quoted, and I'm going to quote now the Cyprus Mail, the UK remains the top destination for Cypriot students with approximately 1% of the population studying there at any one time and around 40,000 alumni of UK institutions in total. Despite its small size, Cyprus ranks as the 10th most important source country for international students in the UK. And that's according to recent statistics. The universities of Reading, Essex and Sussex traditionally have the largest number of Cypriots. The British High Commissioner announced um, that when you look at all these universities, the Cypriot students seem to be faring extremely well, close quote. I'm just going to sum up now um, with the question of, you know, why in all the 54 states, why Cyprus? Um, what is it that there's this attraction to come over to Britain? And as I was writing this paper, I came up with just one word, and that is influence. With such a huge population of um, Cypriots that have traveled and settled in the UK, the education, professional, and family life are grounded in the UK. Why so many Cypriots flock to UK universities, apart from the fact that Britain is a place of cultural formations, as I said, I can only sum it up in one word, influence. When we think of the well-known author, Virginia Woolf, 
in her book, Into the Lighthouse. There's a character, Charles Tamsley, a bright young philosopher. And he is understood by the kindly Mrs. Ramsey to be writing a dissertation on the influence of something upon somebody. In Small World by David Lodge, another young researcher, Percy McGarrigal, his thesis is on the influence of Shakespeare on T.S. Eliot. In both texts, influence has become the central point. For Cypriot diaspora, in many ways, their great influence on British culture and education has been impactful. It has enhanced the status quo of belonging and has promoted a better understanding of unity in academia, politics, business, etc. The interrelationship between Britain and Cyprus is undeniably an already hybridized condition that is both impactful and powerful. Thank you very much. Dr. Nigas, thank you very much uh, for your speech and uh, for the very interesting uh, information and analysis that you shared with us. Um, now, uh, since we have spared some time and uh, despite the fact that we have not received any comments by the audience, any questions. Uh, I would like to uh, facilitate the process and ask myself two questions uh, for, each, uh, for each speaker, starting with Professor Theophanus. Uh, Professor, how would you assess the role of the United Kingdom in the um in the in the ongoing uh round of negotiations for the cyprus question uh, let me just remind uh, our audience that in the last informal meeting in geneva uh, the turkey cypriot side supported by turkey uh, submitted uh, a new position uh, for uh, equal sovereignty which uh, essentially aims to review, to revise the, uh, the record of the negotiations. How do you assess the role of the United Kingdom in this current phase of the Cyprus question? And the second uh, question that I have for you, um, uh, uh, how do you believe that the status of the British bases can be affected as a result uh, of both the Brexit and uh, the new developments with the uh, Mauritius and the Chagos uh, archipelago and the decision of the International Court of Justice about that case. Do you see a, 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 a different future for the uh, British uh, sovereign basis in Cyprus? Uh, very interesting questions. Let me start with the first one, and then we'll get to the second one. Uh, now, before the Turkish invasion, the role of the United Nations, I know you asked me about Britain, but let me tell you, that the United Nations had a very fair stance. It supported a unitary state. It, uh, it, it stood tall against the ideas for partition and all that. And so did Britain. Now, after 74, although in the island you had an invasion, although the bi-communal dimension of the problem, it's not the most important one, the Security Council, you know, it gave a mandate to the UN Secretary General to pursue bi-communal negotiations. Okay, now, in, a, in one way or another, Turkey, Turkish actions were tolerated. So... In all these discussions, the UN tried to find middle ground between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. Now, and now comes Britain. Britain assisted that role. It tried to play the middle ground, to, you know, in between the two. Now, if you see the negotiating framework from 74 to today, it has shifted dramatically towards the position of the Turkish side. We didn't have a solution because of the Turkish maximalism to the present day. 
even in, even to the present day, Britain tries to keep the the process alive by trying to take a middle position to bridge differences. Now, is that fair? I think no. And but I would be critical both of the UK, of the United Nations, and of the UK. Now, the other, having said that, I would say. Um, I cannot m expect much differently if I take the, pos the official position of the government of the Republic of Cyprus, the successive governments. They played that tune. They got used to it. So you have a stalemate. And at the same time, while Tatar and Erdogan are talking about two states, etc., etc., you know, Cypriot governments, you know, insist on positions that in the past it was the Turkish agenda, which became now part of the Greek Cypriot agenda. So there is a, a confusion about that. Uh, on our side, that this is an opportunity to readdress, reassess, revisit our position. Point number two, British basis. Let me share with you the following. Uh, bases are part of the agreement of 1960, and they serve British and other interests there. Uh, it's important for us to honor our signature, but it's also important for Britain to reciprocate. The bases are there, serving particular interests, but they have obligations. And those obligations were not carried out by Britain. Now, if, I, if we take legal perspectives, you know, they could be challenged in one way or another. Philosophically, and seeing the geography of the area, I would like to see them as part of the security system of Cyprus if they play their role accordingly. So, my position is that uh, we should, that's why we should discuss with Britain about the substance of the Cyprus question. We could discuss the legal aspects of the basis given Mauritius and the fact that Europe, England, Britain is not a member of the European Union anymore. But at the end of the day, any, any issue would be political. And if I were to make a suggestion to the government of the Republic of Cyprus, is that they have every legitimate right while the president goes to these talks, not in his capacity as the Greek Cypriot leader, but in his capacity of this, as president of the Republic of Cyprus, to request from the UK and Greece to act accordingly so that, uh, the, that Turkish expansionism is contained and that they work with all their means for the reestablishment of the territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus. So, and I'm saying this, although you understand that a sizable portion of the public opinion in Cyprus would like to see the basis out. Um, I understand that feeling, I understand those feelings, but I want to, you know, explore the possibility where the relations including the bases remain, but at the same time, it's important to see mutual objectives being addressed effectively and in a way which is also fair. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, for Dr. Nigas, uh, also two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, you, you, in your speech, uh, you talked about the influence yes. uh, acted on the Cypriots by the United Kingdom um, in the in in the literature of international relations. We usually use the term "soft power," which is not exclusively about um, influence, but it also includes influence as yeah. one of its mm -hmm. of its pillars um, and my question is uh, is related with 
uh, with this uh, with this issue uh, let me uh, reverse mm. uh, this uh, this uh, interrelation uh, how are the cypriots perceived by the uh, local populations what attributes do the local populations ascribe on the cypriot community on the cypriots individually preferably in the united kingdom how do they see them how do they interact with them and uh, allow me one more yes. question before yes. you provide your answer for both yeah. of them uh, uh, how does the cyprus conflict uh, color the cypriot social activity in the uk uh, 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 and how does this uh, uh, this conflict play out in the relations of the cypriot of the cypriot community with other communities in the united kingdom yes um Thank you very much. Two very important questions. And of course, yes, the self-power. What we have seen in studies and discussions is that the Cypriots are viewed as very positive people. I know in different areas, whether it's politics, law, business, education, and I can speak highly of education, um, they welcome the Cypriots. And I think it's the, 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 the culture, their culture is one that they, dis, they expose, um, espouse a lot on respect. There, there's a, a, an, inner, an innate drive in them to do better, to secure the best jobs. And you don't hear um, that the, the Cypriots are very focused. We see Cypriots, the Cypriot diaspora, as pe a group of people who are very focused on achieving the best and leaving a legacy for their generation. That I do believe, it, it's something that is so evident. It's actually emulated by other cultural groups. And that in itself, I believe with all my heart that this stems from the close knit, the grandparents being very close knit and instilling those values in them. It is something that it has not been broken away from the Cypriots. So their influence, when, when they go in at universities and in business, the way they interact with other people is with a high level of degree. They know their identity, which is why I started with identity. They know who they are. They are very confident. And you don't hear Cypriots getting into fights and quarrels and, and all of that. When they're projected in the news, there's always a very... Um, very professional and very, very confident and positive bent towards the, the, the Cypriots. I have worked, and as I said to you early on, I've been to Cyprus. I, my colleagues are in universities where the population of Cyprus, uh, you know, we've got a high pro proportion of Cypriots, and the, the, even in getting the grades, you'll find them being top. So, I can't, from a personal perspective, I only have the best prison, not because I'm given this paper for the, for the Cypriots. I, you know, I, I look at cultural groups, I study cultural groups, and I have to say, in terms of power, the fact that they pay, though, you know, to, to study at universities, and university fees are quite high. Some years ago, you remember the government raised it to 9,000 um, pounds, I think it was, per year or per yeah but the, the the university's fees for foreign students as well as homegrown students are quite high the money they bring in has led to areas where the homes are good you've got really good homes the businesses food music entertainment literature restaurants it, it's second to none but that's the investment the financial investment um, I, I'm conscious of the time. So just to say, in terms of conflict, um, of course, every, uh, it, I think Cypriots are very bright. And whenever you have groups of people, there's always the jealousy and the, the tendency for groups to, you know, fight and quarrel. But 
what I see is that confidence, that base, that grounding they have. They're able to avoid lots of um, cu cultural conflicts. I think that's what your question was about. That can only come from the upbringing and the integrity and what they stand for, the power, the self-power. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we don't have enough time for one more round of uh, of questions and for more discussion. Mm. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much uh, for your very interesting and insightful mm -hmm. speeches. And uh, since we have uh, two or three more minutes, I would like to give the floor to each one of you for one uh, minute uh, for a closing remark, uh, one minute for each, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Nigas this time. Dr. Nigas. Yes. Um... All, all I'd like to say is that education plays a very important role in any society. Um, a few years ago, I read the, um, the Spirit Level, the book, and it was clear by the authors that a country that does not have a good education, we might as well say it's a fallen country. The Cypriot students have helped boost um, our education system that translates into a financial um, realm, which has allowed for businesses to flourish and provide work, not just for Cypriots, but for people living in Britain. And to, for this, I am truly grateful for the Cypriot diaspora in Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, Professor Stefanos, your closing remark? I'm very pleased to have participated in this session. I have <laughs> very carefully what uh, Dr. Elizabeth Nichols had to say, especially about education, mm -hmm. the contribution of uh, uh, Cypriots in Britain. Mm -hmm. I admit that my children have been studying in Britain as well. And um, so I think with what I've heard, despite uh, problems, issues, I think there is a great scope uh, and a range of issues to be further addressed so that we could come with outcomes that would enhance a mutual objective mm -hmm. interest. I have no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Thank you very much, point. Professor. I agree. I, I agree. Totally agree with that. Thank you. Yes. And I've enjoyed your, your talk, your speech immensely. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you. I enjoyed yours too. Thank and you. It's a pleasure seeing both of you on screen. I hope we'll continue working, you know, more into the future. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And uh, many thanks to our audience, uh, to the people that followed this um, uh, this uh, this session today, and to the organizers. And uh, this is how we close. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope that the rest of the, of the conference will, will be as interesting as it has been so far. Thank you.